Hello, this is Dr. Babo, starting on lecture three on metaphysics of East and West. Let's start with a prayer. Father, we ask for your anointing and favor. Give us insight that we cannot get it on our own. We need your supernatural work, a realization. Let it be, uh, we want to understand, Lord, and we want to grasp the concept so that we could effectively serve you better. Thank you, Lord, in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's start with the lecture, with the clapping. Yeah, I'll be excited. Bring some coffee. Pause and bring some coffee. Maybe, maybe 30 minutes. Mato Chef, what do you think? All right, uh, our lecture second uh, was done. If you haven't seen it, go back, go back um, because we, I'm gonna build up on, and now it's not independently built. This is all interlocked, so you have to know two in order to get three. We learned about East and Western difference, and we learned about what other schools are thinking, doing about metaphysics, Oxford, um, doing annual uh, paper uh, competition, which we try to attend or enter, you know, Berkeley also, and I, I share about how I confronted by Paul Firebrand uh, when I was 18, and I stood my ground. I'm an irrationalist, I believe, because it's unbelievable, and things like that. Metaphysics has many different ways to approach understand reality. And the primary thing that I'm looking at is not teach you philosophy, but be for you to be a philosopher. There's a huge difference, you know, um, and I'm going to go in more details. And I challenge Cambodian metaphysicists to talk about your, uh, your issue. You know, what is the relationship between Heidegger's nothingness and Cambodian zeroness? Well, that, that would be like the most fantastic topic, you know. There's no point for you to go to Martin Heidegger's nothingness, zeroness, you know, uh, nothingness and, and argue at that court. You know, you should bring it to your Cambodian court, right? And my teaching is more not interested in information, but more of inspiration and impartation. No, really, I want, I want you to listen to my lecture and go, my God, I, I never realized that, you know, and... And then some people are really, especially Christians, some Christians were taught by your leaders that philosophy is from the devil or something like that. You know, oh, if you're a true Christian, you don't really study philosophy. And that kind of nonsense, you know. And, and how can you do theology without philosophy when theology is based on philosophical framework? Anyways, after my two of my lecture, uh, my uh, star student, Lida Sim, uh, she posted this in her Facebook, Learning Philosophy. For, I guess it really spoke to her because by and large, uh, the, edu the modern education system of Cambodia is still also very Western twisted or Western bent. So uh, we are, although we are very naturally both and kind of people, you know, you have to choose either this or either that. So learning philosophy versus living philosopher. And that's what I introduced. And I'm going to actually go in further by saying it's both, right? It's both. So Lida, actually, uh, I met her last week in Phnom Penh, and we're launching. Well, this is actually the Oxford uh, Dictionary of the Philosophy. And uh, Father Kang um, translated this. It took him five years. So we're kind of debating or, or sharing that. And this is Lida. And so uh, we're going to go in difference between knowing versus doing, or knowing and doing. What, what does that mean? Well, once again, it's all going to be about inspiration and impartation. <laughs> uh, this is philosophy. This is my philosophy on teaching philosophy. It's actually said by Benjamin Franklin. Tell me and I forget. Teach me and I remember. Involve me and I learn. And that's why I'm involving my stu ex-students to doing projects together. So what does it mean to be philosopher? Charin in Korean. Well, there are three aspects, isn't it? The black triangle, knowing, red circle, doing, and blue, being. And a lot of times, uh, most of my life, I so-called philosopher, and uh, lot, majority of them, I would say, they're talkers, 80%, roughly. You know, 80% of philosophy major that I met in my life, basically, they just talk about philosophy. Talk more than he or she does or be. You know, talk about philosophy of Nietzsche, for example, favorite. Ugh, I'm an existentialist. I, I, you know, I follow Nietzsche. What are you doing about it? What do you mean? You know, 
what do you mean? <laughs> well, because they, they primarily think that knowledge is in the head. So if you know, then you could talk about it and it's becoming a being. It's not. There are, and then there are another flip side of it is they're doer. They just doing all this philosophy, but they really very lack of knowledge. So doing more than he or she knows or becoming. Or there's someone who really think he's a philosopher, but he knows jack about philosophy or d done nothing about philosophical. Has not contributed anything to expand uh, the area of philosophy, right? Uh, never mind not writing a book on it, never read a book on philosophy, but then he just think that life somehow, you know, and little mantra, you know, like little thing. Uh, uh, just stuff that you find in, 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 you know, what do you call it, tweet? Tweet or something like that. You know, the Trump level, you know. The Trump level, like, that's what he really believes. And he really thinks it's like just saying, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great. Does not make you great, you know. Uh, it's, it's like that, you know. Be more than he or she know or do, you know. So what I'm really getting at is balance between knowing, doing, and being. So it kind of balances out, you know, who you are really comes out of your doing, your doing really comes out of your knowledge. This is what I'm going for, right? And this is what I call where um and yang, light and darkness, water and fire, mingle, right? Okay, the moment I show this, some of this well-meaning Christian, oh, like, oh God, he's turned Buddhist, or oh, he become cult. And I'm sorry if you, if you, if that's what you think. Yeah. Well, uh, out of my PhD, uh, I came up with uh, ontology that mingles with epistemology. And Dr. Damien So OCMS said, ontology is. Epistemology, almost epistemology, or he said epistemology is almost ontology, and he's talking about this relationship. And this is not my lecture today. My lecture today is not about that. It's about being a philosopher, lecture three. So I'm interested in Matao Chef, right? Was denken Sie? 당신의 생각은 무엇입니까? I'm not interested in objective truth at this point. I'm interested in your subjective truth on that objective truth. That's what I'm going for, and that's what makes you a philosopher, right? Philosopher talker, I mean, I've met plenty, and they almost probably read from Philosophy of Dummies or Metaphysics for Dummies, which both books I have. <laughs> but their level of understanding is that, and they could sort out, you know, this is philosophy, and the metaphysics is, Western metaphysics is a subset of that, and within that we have Heidegger, Kant, Martin Buber, and on and on, and information after information after information. You're good at talking about what you know in your head, but you're not a philosopher. That's not good enough for me. It's like talking about fishermen talker. Have you met fishermen who always talk about catching fish? You know, probably read through a fishing for dummies and never went fishing, never got on the boat, never invested in a fishing rod. But man, you could talk about fishing, generally speaking. There's the non-commercial fishing, commercial fishing, fishing, fly fishing, sports fishing, leisure fishing, information after information. Man, but it's only talk is nonsense. You haven't caught a fish. It's like people talk about mission and never been to mission field and doesn't have a mission field, you know, but talk about theory of mission. It's talk about people who never went out to golfing but talks about golf and the tee shots should be like that and never been to you know tennis play, tennis court but talks about how you should serve this at 45 degree angle you never been to basketball court you talk about oh you know free throw should be like this you never been to soccer field but you talk about oh the free throw you know you know the, 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 you know whatever whatever you know you get my point right nonsense well, i could talk about fishing and i caught a few fish here and there you know I caught some yellowtail. Yellowtail is good hamachi, oh, good sashimi. I freaked my daughter out, <laughs> made her cry. But at that level, I was kind of a experienced talker. I, but I still knew a lot more about doing. And then I pretty much became a doer. You know, then I got serious and started going out and started investing more. And I started going out two nights and three days, fishing trip for tuna. And then I trained myself to catch tuna and finally caught my first Yellowtail, which is great, 45 pounds. I don't know what that is in kilo. Oh, you no. Know, hey. But I haven't really reached that existential fisherman where who I am, what I do is equal. And wow, you know. And one of my college buddy, and we have an annual December uh, party uh, with 
our buddies. And this guy, you know, Chungi, wow. He has become that existential philo uh, not philosopher, fisherman, you know. When he started catching 250 pounds, bluefin tuna, bluefin tuna. Wow, he's the man, right? In the fisherman's world, he has reached that place. <laughs> Let me talk about theology then. How do you become existential theologian? In your doing, knowing, and being. It had happened at Princeton, you know. Princeton is a beautiful campus. Oh my goodness. You know, when I first went there, walk on campus, I thought, wow, this is great. Later, later, many years later, I went to Oxford campus and go, oh, they just want to copy. <laughs> yeah. Well, Princeton Modern Library is beautiful. Their graduates are so cute, so young, and their economic impact is amazing. Their $1.5 billion economic output. Wow, can you imagine? So it's a very prospering academic institution. And they held a, a conference, and the topic was model of church planting for second generation Asian Americans. And they invited six speakers, five Princetonian graduates, and one Fuller, Fuller Theological Seminary, right? And so they asked debate, and it was really a debate, you know? Talk about Princeton's philosophy of church planting versus Bob's philosophy of church planting, because I didn't learn, I did not learn that from Fuller. So it was pretty much my philosophy. And so we got into it, we debated over it. And after three days of conference, we're having tea. And the found or the organizer who's the head of the systematic theology, the Dr. Sangyan Lee, Lee Sangyan Paksanim of Princeton, he's the head of the systematic theology. And he comes over and says, Bob. You know, these five Princetonian graduates, uh, they're knowing and doing is separate. Because a lot of them don't even, they're not even church planters. They don't even engage in stuff that they talk about. They don't practice. They're just theorists, just like the golfer who never went to the field, you know, uh, uh, mission, mission, missiologist who never, doesn't have a mission field or never been to mission field. He said, you know, they talk about this church planting for second gen Korean American, but but you're the one who's doing it. You know, you planted five churches for Korean American, Asian American. And so, well, for me at the time, doing and knowing was kind of, and it was still awkward. It hasn't, I haven't really reached the point where it has become me. But you know, there's a segue, you know, this stage of do and know, theologian, practitioner, reflective scholar, you know, I haven't really reached that point, but there's a segue, it will become that. So when, I was confirmed with five of those guys. Basically, I took over. And next year, a three-day lecture, Knowing and Doing Theology and Church Planting. And that actually led me to a lectureship at Gordon Carnwell as well. But this is like 26 years ago, 27, 28 years, no, 28 years ago. Wow, that's a long time ago. But I met someone from that because uh, 2019 April, I was invited to Torch Trinity in Korea and did a special lecture there uh, on... Kap ben uh, and uh, uh, the effects of the church growth principle of Fuller. There, I met not only Lee Gyuk Sanggyosanim, Professor Lee of uh, Cambodia Presbyterian Theological Seminary, but I met Lee Jung Suk. You know, she walked she walk up to me and said, Pastor o, I met you at Princeton 26 years ago. Like, what? Well, she turns out she became the uh, chancellor after Princeton. And so we had a marvelous time uh, having meals together and wow, and of course uh, with Professor Lee as well. Uh, well, let's use this as a starting point of my lecture three, learning philosophy versus living philosopher. Okay, what does that mean? Well, let the lecture, third, third lecture begin. Well, my definition of theologian is congruent, which means similar as a biblical philosopher. Uh, you know, I was challenged by some uh, well-meaning but kind of naive uh, person who says, well, you know, I don't, I don't believe in philosophy. I just do theology. It's like, really? <laughs> it's like, you don't believe in philosophy? You just do theology? What do you think your theology is based on? What frame of philosophical work that you is your theology based on? You know, so I get really mad when someone makes a statement like that. You know, you cannot have theology without philosophy because philosophy is basis in which your theology is built, 
right? Karl Barth is a theologian. He's a biblical philosopher because he actually embrace, he understands that he comes out of the Western philosophical framework and he will never match Eastern way of thinking, right? So, but he said this, and which is I agree. Karl Barth said, we must hold the Bible in one hand and newspaper in the other. And I said, amen to that. We must hold the Heidegger in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Don't talk about philosophy. Live out philosophy. Be the philosopher. And the whole thing about coming together, right? Coming together. Because you could have your pun on pen, right? And you need to mix both Heidegger and Phnom Penh post. So what happened has to mix together. That's my point. And let's go to Phnom Penh post. You know, I, I will show you. And then in this Phnom Penh post, you know, all this yearly thing that happens, daily thing that happens. And I found this, wow, the back of uh, the magazine, I found this Khmer pride. Khmer, of course, means Cambodian. Cambodian Pride by Angkor Beer. Hmm. And I, I, I was quite actually offended by that. I was actually thinking, I felt really sorry for all the Cambodian people. You know, it's like, why does Taekwondo represent Cambodia? I mean, what's wrong with this picture, right? <sighs> why does, you know, Angkor Beer thinks that when you show a guy doing Taekwondo, it's Khmer Pride. What do you think? Right? When did Taekwondo become Cambodian national sports? TKD, Taekwondo, right? I know Taekwondo. I'm a Taekwondo talker. <laughs> I, never, I never did Taekwondo, right? But after this presentation, you'll say, well, he should, yeah, he could talk about Taekwondo. Why? Because I learned Taekwondo about Taekwondo from this man. He's my father in law, Master Kang, right? Wow, he went to America 1964. First Korean Taekwondo master to be invited by American government to come and teach the Air Force uh, colonels and you know uh, officers, you know, in Sacramento. Wow, and he brought his disciples from Yongdeungpo, Korea. Right, he's the man. Right, he was in the newspaper. The talks to mayors and start training young kids in America. And he was a grandmaster. I mean, he could kick, he could train. Wow. <laughs> now you know why uh, I'm, I was nice to my wife. <laughs> Watch this. This is physiologically impossible. Physics does not support. You cannot have a freestanding stones like this and crack it. Now I, I'm going to, oh my goodness. This is crazy. I, you know, when I saw this, I said, Dad. How is it possible? That's physiologically not possible. Physically, this is impossible. Something has to hold the weight. He said, no. He said, when I meditate, when I think, and then he said, I see my hand in the other side, and I just go for it. It cuts like tofu. He was an elder at a church. He was a man of faith. Wow, he taught me so much. He was also a kamdo, uh, uh, I think sixth degree or fourth degree. He was kung fu, uh, third degree. I mean, he was master of all. He went to China and learned Tai Chi. I learned some of the Tai Chi from him. Not a lot, just a little. <laughs> it was in the TV, and also he had a gun. So don't, don't mess with him. He's a man of men, right? He had, up to his life, 20,000 disciples. Wow, including Chuck Norris, right? Some of you don't know Chuck Norris in Cambodia. He was a movie star. He did all the karate, martial art kind of movie. And later in life, he became the 10th degree. There's only six in, in the world, 10th degree, right? And then when they finally start Hall of Fame award uh, in, in America, he was number one to join. Uh, first one to become the uh, uh, inducted into Hall of Fame of Taekwondo. He was not only learn, learn at Sacramento State, but he taught at Sacramento State as a professor. And because he registered Taekwondo as an international sport of American sports, Taekwondo is not a Korean sport. He registered as American amateur sports. He was able to enter Olympics. A lot of people don't know that. So I want to make sure that he gets the right, that he gets the honor, you know. Um, 
and I was able to edit and publish a book called Solitary Road of a Master, bilingual book. And when you find him in Google, that book, you're going to find him everywhere. And he's, he's the who's who of, of Taekwondo world. So let me ask the same question again. When did Taekwondo become Cambodian national sports? I mean, for Koreans, yeah. But why, why does it represent that? What's wrong with the picture that I show you? Okay, so let me give you a chance to redeem yourself. Which one better represent Kamai Pride? Right? The Taekwondo guy? Would this guy represent Taekwondo, represent Kamai Pride? You like this? My finger? <laughs> Taekwondo or this guy? Actually, it's Cambodian martial art, right? So I actually did some Photoshop and changed. You know, of course, definitely this should represent Kamai, right? And then I said, something's wrong with this Angkor beer. So uh, Angkor beer, premium beer, our country, our beer. But guess what? It's not owned by Kamai person. It's owned by foreigner. No wonder they really don't care, right? As long as they could sell their beer. They don't, they're not, they don't. The, the, there was no one in the company stop and ask, hey, how come you think Kamai Pride is, could be represented by Taekwondo, right? Matao Chef. And that's what I'm doing right now. I want Kamai philosopher to think through, combine both things, right? And philosophy, and, and then really come up with what's wrong with this picture, right? Well, this is my, my answer, my subjective truth answer, not objective. This is what I take. When I, saw, when I see something like that, then I always think, oh, this is just byproduct of neoliberalism. What's neoliberalism? What is neoliberalism, right? And, and this lecture is not about neoliberalism. I'm not going to get into it deeply. But just it stems off of the social Darwinism of Herbert Spencer. And he really believed that, you know, uh, evolved from the monkey to civilized. And so there are certain group that should be dominated, be ruled over, be squashed, right? And guess what? What was the method of implementing social Darwinism all over the world? It's called globalism, globalization, right? And so Noam Chomsky said, neoliberalism is the immediate and foremost enemy of genuine participatory democracy, not just in the United States, but across the planet, and will be for the foreseeable future. And he said that many decades ago, and now it's reality. They learn to commercialize, dehumanization and commercialization where a child is born, and they could literally tell you how much money is gonna spend on McDonald's, how much money in entertainment, on sports, coffee, this is crazy. This is wild. So every human has been dehumanized and by the pricing of how much tax we could do, and then we could do that globally. Let's sell GE, Gillette, Nokia, Samsung, City. I mean, banking system. And then they projected that productivity level goes up and everybody's income will go up like this. But truth is, the real wages actually went down. From 70s to 2000, it went down. So who's making all the money? Right. So uh, uh, economist Ha Jun Chang of Korea, Cambridge, said that, man, globalization, capitalism, that really is doing damage. You know, I love this artist who wrote, every morning I wake up the wrong side of capitalism. <laughs> capitalism forced factories all over, including Beijing. And so this Chinese artist vacuumed air in Beijing for 100 days and made a brick from it. This is the brick from a vacuum cleaner. That's crazy. That's artistic way of saying, I mean, he's a philosopher, isn't it? He's a doer. He's a beer. I love, I, I love artists like that who are making a statement in, in the field that they're in. But what about you as a philosopher? What about you as a Christian? What about you as a theologian? What do you say about this globalizing, capitalistic, you know, godless capitalism? I'm not saying capitalism is wrong. Why is it wrong? It's good. Godless capitalism is the greatest evil, right? So it is just like we're going to conquer. You know, we're going to conquer these savages. You know, they say imperialism, we're going to conquer these savages. We're going to kill them. You know, and a lot of times in Jesus' name. You know, and that's what we need to repent of. So how are, we putting, how are we putting this together, right? 
how can we put these two, two things together? What is the role of Cambodian philosopher facing this kind of social issues? I mean, we really, if, you, if you're doing a small group right now, you should stop right now, pause it, and then get into it and talk about what the shit. What do you think? Talk about that, right? Because, man, because we're going to now talk about putting all these things together. Now, Martin Heidegger and um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. This is Heidegger's reality. And these are my students at 2007, REPP. And uh, I, I told them, actually, you know, we have a chat room going still after three years. I told them I'm going to be posting this. I hope you guys are watching this. And I told them to interact with me interact with me because uh, I really want uh, this to be ongoing issue right uh, you took one class with me you don't become a philosopher it's a lifelong process so I really want to challenge uh, oh that's good I was able to do it in 26 minutes but I really want to challenge you to think through and if you have to kind of stop and go back and reflect that that's good do that because um, point is not just going through it. The point is that I, I want to learn and I'm going to actually go into more of the Heidegger issue and Dasein issue. Um, and phew, I hope I could bring uh, George Patterson's lecture. I don't know if it's legal uh, to show entire of YouTube teaching, but maybe I could just make a reference to it so you could go watch. Maybe it's illegal for me to put it in my YouTube. But yeah, I want to do everything possible so that you could engage in this philosophical debate, thought process, so that you could, subjective truth will be earned through objective issues that we are dealing with. Because all truth, at the end of the day, is subjective. Truth is truth to you. And I'm not saying truth is subjective. No, subjective truth is only truth to you because it's true to you, not to anybody else. So hopefully I challenge you and uh, please subscribe, please ring the bell, so that next lecture comes on, that you are going to uh, do that. Also, I'm launching uh, September 20th, um, daily Bible study, or daily, I call daily gospel, uh, so that every day I could study the Bible together. All right, well, I hope this was meaningful. I hope to see you at lecture four. All right, see you. Thank you.